Okay, now we're moving on to section 8.3. Um, this section, when we go through the work, you're going to see that it's very, very similar to how we computed confidence intervals in section 8.2. Okay, now the difference here is that the population standard deviation is unknown. We do not know what the population standard deviation is. In 8.2, they always told us what the population standard deviation was. And that's the key difference here between problems from 8.2 and problems from 8.3. Like I said, the work is going to seem very much alike, but how we calculate the critical values, we're going to be using a different distribution because we don't know what our population standard deviation is. Okay, now we're still constructing confidence intervals for the mean. Okay, so we're still using our x bar. Now, why do we? Why are we going to use a different distribution for when sigma is unknown? Okay, now um, the book does have the name of the person that came up with the distribution. Um, it's called the student's t distribution. Students, uh, it's a little t, t distribution. Now, if you read the book, they do give his name. I forgot his name, but he worked for a brewing company. And his, um, his pen name was Student, okay? This wasn't his actual name. This is what the name he published stuff under. But anyways... He was, uh, he was working in a brewery company, and he was doing statistical samples with uh, the beer, how much hops it had in it, and whatnot. And what he found was that using the Z distribution, like we did in 8.2, no longer um, provided confidence intervals that were accurate. And he wondered why. So um, he did a bunch of studies um, to find out the cause. And what he found was that normally when we uh, do a statistical study, our sample size is very large. Okay? Since our sample size is very large, the sample mean and the sample st standard deviation should be very close to the true population mean in the true population standard deviation. Since they're so close to one another for a large sample size, the distribution is approximately the Z distribution. Now when you find when you go on uh, to use smaller sample sizes, the the distribution you get is no longer approximately normal it's no longer approximately the z distribution okay so this is where he came out with the students t distribution instead now you could look at my bullet points on my notes i'm not going to write every every bullet up here um it says it's similar to the z distribution but has more probability in its tails so if this is what the z distribution would look like okay so here, let me draw this one a little better. It comes down more like this. So right here would be Z. The T distribution looks more like this. Over on its tails are fatter, and it's not as high. Okay. So there's more probability in its tails rather than um, its its hump. So this would be the T distribution. Okay, now when we're using the z distribution, the mean was always zero. That's also true for the t distribution, and it's also symmetric about zero. So, meaning if I were to draw a line all the way down, this half, if I were to flip it over, it matched with the other half. So, it has many similar properties like the z distribution. Now, the exact shape of this distribution depends on something called the degrees of freedom, which is just always n minus 1 in this case, okay? Um, 
There are other formulas and other things you can do that use degrees of freedom. And for that specific purpose, may have its own formula. But when we're calculating things using the T distribution, the degrees of freedom is N minus 1. Okay? So the larger the degrees of freedom, so the only way to make this large is if we make our sample size large. Now the larger the uh, degrees of freedom, the more closely... This, um, this, the T distribution gets to being the normal distribution. So if you're look at my graph here, I've got a uh, bunch of different colors. Remember, the black was is the Z distribution. So now the red would be if I had a small sample size, meaning my degrees of freedom is small. That would be more like the red curve. And then when I go to the blue curve, my degrees of freedom got larger. So it got closer to the black curve. But then I make my degrees of freedom even larger. That's the green curve. It gets closer and closer to the black curve. Now I know my visual uh, here um, is poorly drawn. It's cluttered. If you look in the book, I don't have the page reference on my notes, but if you look in the book in section 8.3, um, they do have a very nice picture of this, and they show you what higher degrees of freedom do. Okay. All right. So um, instead of finding Z scores we could find t-scores. Okay. If you recall, this was the z-score formula. It was um, x minus um, mu divided by uh, sigma. Well, we could find t-scores. x bar minus, oh, oops, x minus x bar divided by s, the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Okay. Now this has the same interpretation. This is how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. Okay. Um, again, this number could be positive or this number could be negative. All right, so now if you look at my notes, you see a big table right there, okay? You may or may not have to use this table. That all depends whether you have a certain function in your calculator, okay? I'm going to teach it right now as if you had the function in your calculator. And if you do not have the function in your calculator, we will. I will illustrate how to go through that list to find the correct critical values, okay? I'm gonna do my the best I can to draw it up here, but make sure you have my notes so you're looking at that table so we can figure it out. Now, if you wanna make a confidence interval, well, the confidence interval is gonna be your point estimate x bar minus your error, x bar plus the error. That hasn't changed, okay? So, our confidence level, we are told the confidence level is some percentage. And then to find our alpha, we do 1 minus the confidence level. And then we still have to find alpha over 2. Okay? All that process was the same, and it will be the same for uh, the next section as well. So we have all this. We're told all this information. But now, what changes here is the error formula. It's going to look very similar to the error formula for when we knew uh, the population standard deviation. It's T of alpha over 2 times the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Let's compare this real quick with the formula for the last section, z alpha over 2, uh, population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. The formulas look exactly the same. 
So as I mentioned you guys in the very first video, the last video in this video, the process on constructing these confidence intervals is very procedural. It's a step-by-step -step process. You get your point estimate, usually it's told to you. You calculate your error. Whatever formula you need to use is dependent on the distribution you're talking about. And then you just do x bar minus your error, x bar plus your error, okay? So the key difference here, this one is for sigma being known. This one is for sigma unknown, okay? We're going to be dealing with this, okay? But now, how do we get t of alpha over 2? t of alpha over 2 is going to be equal to, now this is in your calculator. You may not have this function. It depends on what version of the calculator you have, like the software stall, installed on it. But it's inverse t alpha over 2, comma, degrees of freedom. Let me, let me write this a little better. Alpha over 2, comma, the degrees of freedom. Now, once you have this number, this is a lot like your inverse norm number. So if you remember when we did inverse norm, it sometimes gave you a positive number. And uh, Sorry, it didn't sometimes give you a positive number. It always gave you a negative number, and we turned it positive. Using inverse t with the alpha over 2 will give you a negative number, but we're going to ignore the negative and just take the positive form to plug it into our formula. Okay? Now, let's say you do not have this function on your calculator. I didn't tell you where it was located. It's located in the same place that all of your other distributions are. You hit the second button, and then you hit the vars button. Once you hit the second vars button, uh, inverse t, let's see, I don't know where it's at. It's option number four. If you look on my calculator, option number four, I've got to highlight it, it says inverse t. If you were to hit enter on it, it asks you the area. That's your alpha over two, and it asks you the degrees of freedom. And then you would just paste into the calculator, and you're done, okay? Now, if you do not have that function on your calculator, you have to use that table that's given in uh, my lecture notes. You can also find this table in the book. But if you notice, it's sectioned up like this. So you've got your degrees of freedom on this side. And then here, up top here, it says one tail or two tail. What you just have to do is find your alpha over 2 value in, this, uh, in one of these columns. So alpha over 2 would be the one tail. So one tail is alpha over 2. And they'll have numbers like, you know, let's get this down a bit. They'll have numbers like 0 0.005, 0 0.01. Uh, point, oh, let's see what's the next one, point zero two five and so on. So, to, how to read this table, what you do, first you calculate the degrees of freedom. Remember, degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. So let's say we had 18, our n was equal to 18 then our degrees of freedom would be 17. You go down on this column until you get to 17, and then you look in the column for the one tail alpha over 2 number that you found. Okay? So let's say that our alpha over 2 came out to be 0 0.01. So then we would look in this column right here, in this row right here, this value right there 
that would represent my t of alpha over 2. That is the number you are going to use as your critical value. If you notice in this table, all the numbers are positive, which is a good thing. Okay, so you don't have to worry about making them positive. Okay, so let's go ahead and do an example. Let's see. Um, it says a hospital is trying to cut down emergency room uh, emergency room wait times. It is interested in the amount of time patients must wait before being called back to be examined. An investigation committee randomly surveys 70 patients, so they tell us our um, sample size. The sample mean was 1.5 hours. That's our point estimate with a sample standard deviation of 0 0.5 hours. Now this is very critical right here. If you recall the wording of the uh, problems in the previous section, they told us it was a population standard deviation. In this problem, they tell us we have a sample standard deviation. You really have to read these problems to determine whether you are using the Z distribution or the T distribution. Since they told us the sample standard deviation, that means the population standard deviation is unknown. Otherwise, they would have told it to you. So that means we're using the t-distribution for this problem. So, uh, let's see, confidence level. Do they tell us the confidence level? Oh, they do not tell us the confidence level. Let's uh, just make it 90%. Okay, so our confidence interval is going to be x bar minus the error, comma, x bar plus the error. The error that we're going to use, since we are using a t distribution, we, we have a sample standard deviation, it's going to be t of alpha over 2 times s divided by square root of n. We know what our sample standard deviation is. We know what our pop or sorry, our sample size is. We don't know what t of alpha over 2 is. Well, t of alpha over 2 is equal to inverse t of alpha over 2, comma, degrees of freedom. Well, now let's find our degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So that's 69. We've got an n of 70. And our alpha over 2, I'm just going to quickly give this to you. So if 1 minus 0 0.9 is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 divided by 2 is 0 0.05. So we get t of 0 0.05 is equal to inverse t of 0 0.05 comma degrees of freedom, 69. Now we plug this into the calculator. Um, let's see, inverse t, 0 0.05, degrees of freedom, 69, paste, hit enter, negative 1.667, and we're going to make it positive, 1.667 is our t of 0 0.05. Okay, so now that we've got our t of alpha over 2, our t of 0.05, see, write that over. Let's write it up here. Uh, 1.667. Oh, uh, 0.05. So now we can calculate our error. This is 1.667 times the sample standard deviation, which is 0 0.5 divided by the square root of our sample size, 70. We go ahead and plug this into our calculator. 1.667 times 0 0.05 divided by the square root of 70. It's really tiny. 
Uh, let's see, point zero zero nine nine. Okay, now let me get rid of all the information we don't need anymore. Because now that we have our error, point zero zero nine nine, we could finally construct our confidence interval. Oh, I needed that. X bar was equal to, what was X bar? Equal to, again, it was 1.5. So our upper bound is X bar plus E, which is 1.5 plus 0 0.0099. Well, that's equal to 1.5, uh, 0 0.099. And x bar minus e is 1.5 minus 0 0, uh, 0.099, which is 1.4901. Uh, uh, Let's see, I might have that one wrong. Let's see, 1.5 minus 0, 0.0099. Oh, I got it right. I got it right. So, the confidence interval that we constructed is right there. So, let's go ahead and interpret this confidence interval. We had a confidence level of 90%. So, if we were to construct more confidence intervals using the same sample size of 70 and the same confidence level of 90%, we should expect 90% of those confidence intervals to contain the true population average wait time in the emergency room. Okay, Or in other words, layman's terms here, we are 90% confident 90% sure that the true average wait time in the emergency room is between 1.49 hours and 1.5 hours. Okay? So as you can see, this was very much like the previous problem. Okay? So, or the previous uh, section. The only difference here is calculating the area formula, we use the t-distribution. Now, just like in the previous problem or previous section, what they can do is they can give you the interval, ask you to find the point estimate. Remember, you just find the midpoints. They can ask you to find the error associated with it. Um, not only that, your calculator has um, a way to do this confidence interval for you, just like we had the z-interval in your calculator. There's a interval and if you just hit stat and go over to tests and it is give me a second I'll tell you what option it is it is option eight eight T interval and now once you go to T interval here we go it also says if you have data, raw data, you can put it into a list and it'll do it for you. Or we're going to go over to stats. Oh, we're already on stats. And all you have to do is fill in the information. So let me go ahead. Uh, we have a mean of 1.5, a sample standard deviation of 0.5. Our N here was 70, and our confidence level was 90%. So as you can see, here are the values that I have on my calculator, and those are all the same values that were given in the problem, except for the confidence level. Um, I copied and pasted the problem out of the book, and they didn't give a confidence level, so we just assumed that it was 90%. Now, if we hit calculate, it may take a second, but if you look, I got a different answer. I got this answer. Hmm. Give me a second. Inverse T, 0.05 degrees of freedom. I got that right. 
times that by the sample standard deviation, which is 0.05, divided by square root of 70. Oh, I wrote it down incorrectly. T of alpha over 2, I had 0 0.0099. That was actually incorrect. I put an extra 0, which would be 0 0.099. Okay, my apologies. Even with that mistake, the interpretation and in how we proceeded to go about the problem was correct. Okay, so if I do 1.5 plus 0 0.099, I get 1.599. And then if I do 1.5 minus 0 0.099, I get 1.401 which is what matches the calculator's answer. Okay, let's see, here's the calculator's answer. You can see it goes to 1.4004 and 1.5996, okay? We didn't carry out the full decimal places, so it's gonna be uh, slightly off, but it's close enough, okay? Now, you could also find the sample size. I could not find a good problem in the book that uh, finds the sample size in this section, but the formula remains the same. N is equal to, we got E down here. Instead of the population standard deviation, it's the sample standard deviation. Instead of the Z critical number, it's the T critical number, and you square it. So the only difference in this section is we don't know the population standard deviation, so we use the t distribution as opposed to the z distribution.